Boa noite. I am so honored to be the final speaker at this incredible conference in beautiful Floripa. And obrigada to all of you for sticking to this point. So give yourself a big hand. So are you ready? We're going to have games and stories, and we're going to end this evening on a very high note. So we're going to play a warm-up game. And for this game, I need some help. So I'm going to ask someone to come on stage. Um, I'm looking around. Oh, there he is. This is actually a video. If you can just click on it, it'll start playing a video, the background. So ladies and gentlemen, this is my husband, Praveen Kumar. <laughs> he arrived. <laughs> so he literally arrived today, a few hours ago in the airport. He came to watch. He, it just so happened that he could watch me. And I asked him, oh, can you help me on stage? <laughs> so he was kind enough to say yes. So thank you, Praveen. <laughs> Um, all right, so I would like all of you to stand up. So you can watch Praveen. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a few instructions, and if you're ever confused, you can, you can look at him. Okay, so raise your right hand. Point your index finger at the ceiling. Imagine there is a giant clock on the ceiling, and now turn your finger slowly in clockwise direction. 12, 3, 6, 9. Just keep turning your finger. Keep looking at your index finger. Now bend your elbow and bring the finger down below your shoulders. Keep going in a clockwise direction. Now stop. Look at your finger. Is your finger going in the clockwise direction or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise. All right. How did that happen? Perspectives matter. All right. Thank you, Praveen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You can sit down. So you can try that again. So perspectives matter. Sometimes we are doing something in one direction. We think we are doing it one way. And then the person above us is looking at it and wondering, what are we doing? So anyway, this is just something to keep in mind. So let's begin. Oh, there it is. That was what I wanted you to see. See the video? I'm going, to, I'm going to describe to you three scenes. Scene one, a man walks into a video rental store. He, has, he notices an overdue copy of a movie, Apollo 13, in his closet, and he decides to do the right thing and return it. When he returns it to the clerk, however, he is informed that he owes a $40 late fee. So the man is not happy to have to pay the fee when he was trying to do the right thing. Scene two. It's a rainy afternoon in San Francisco, and a man is trying to hail a cab. If you know San Francisco, it's not easy. So he's standing in the sidewalk and trying to hail a cab. Not much luck. This is not the first time it's happened to him, and he is frustrated. Scene three, a huge design conference is happening in a city, and many, many people have come from all over the world to attend. All the hotels are booked, and people cannot find a place to stay. In the meantime, two friends cannot pay rent, so they decide to rent their spare bedroom. Do you recognize these scenes? Yes. The first one is Netflix that disrupted the video rental and the entertainment industry. The second is Uber that disrupted the taxi cab industry. And the third is Airbnb that disrupted 
the hotel and accommodation industry. Now, what insights can we draw from these origin stories? So insight number one, no industry is immune to disruption. In a recent HBR article, CEOs from several industries were asked, how much do they think their industry will be disrupted in the next 12 months? And this is what they answered. The answers were anywhere from 72% to 39%. So the question is not, will your industry be dis disrupted? But it is, how much and when? 72% of global CEOs believe that the next three years will be more significant than the last 50 years. Insight number two. Technology is an enabler to disruption. Things that were expensive and scarce are now ubiquitous and almost free. Cloud computing has made it easier for companies to own a, to st get started and have a data center. Smartphones has made it easier for people to access technology. Social networks has become easy to, uh, to get access to rich, actionable customer data. And these three technologies, you could argue, are what allowed Airbnb and Uber to get a foothold into a well-established industry and to scale rapidly. Add to this new technology like big data or Internet of Things, artificial intel intelligence, machine learning, and Bitcoin, and many, many industries are ripe for disruption. Now, technology is an enabler for disruption, but poor end-to-end -end experience is the catalyst for disruption. In all these stories that I described, the these dis innovations happen based on a genuine need or pain point that was experienced in by this person. So let me give you an example. Imagine you are a proprietor of a coffee store and you want to serve the best cup of coffee to your customers. What do you focus on? The beans, the way you roast the beans and the temperature of the water and so on and so on, right? So you are focusing on serving the best cup of coffee to your customers. In the meantime, this is what your customers experience, right? So let's unpack this experience. So imagine you want a cup of coffee. So you have this idea in your head, you drive, you go, go to the store, you find parking, then you, you go into the store, you see a long line, you stand in line. The person in front of you cannot decide which one do they want, they're thinking. And then in the meantime, you have to get to work, you're looking at your clock. Finally, you order, and you happen to have an unusual name, right? Janaki is an unusual name. And the person, the barista, or the, or the person and the cashier usually mispronounces, misspells your name, and then finally, you get your cup of coffee. Let's see the emotional journey through, a, through this customer's experience. When you wanted to have a cup of coffee, you were very happy. You came, you tried to find parking, maybe you didn't find parking, and you were a little bit, mm, maybe not so happy. You're standing in line, um, and especially if the line is not moving very fast, you're getting a little bit mm, anxious, especially if the person in front of you is is not making a decision quickly and you need to get to work on time. And then finally, when your name gets misspelled or mispronounced, that is pretty much the worst experience for people. And then finally, you get your cup of coffee and you're super happy, right? You could argue that all is well that ends well, right? You, the person is happy in the end. What's the problem? But you could also look at it from another perspective, which is, if a new competitor were to come and replicate your cup of coffee, and they address just two of your pain points, the line issue 
as well as your name issue, you have a disruption. So let me show you a video of a new coffee store in Metreon, San Francisco. <laughs> so the person is placing the order on a, on a mobile phone and a robot makes the coffee. And this robot, um, there are many different, um, you know, special beans, and the beans are roasted specifically according to the instructions given by the person who grew the beans. And um, you come and you uh, put in your code, it says, hello, Sebastian, and, you, and there you are. You get your cup of coffee. So there are no, uh, there's no wait, and your name is not misspelled, right? So you could argue this is something that Starbucks needs to watch, and it does, actually. So now Starbucks offers no time, um, no line. You can order on your mobile phone, and you can pick up your cup of coffee uh, right there from the barista. So Starbucks is watching this. They know where the, end, the low points of their customer experience are, and they're trying to address it. So now, if you think of the points of disruption is the weakest link in your customer experience, think to yourself, how will your industry be disrupted? It's a question to you. So hi, I'm Janaki Kumar. I'm a VP at SAP Design. I run a team called uh, Strategic Design Services. I also am a co-instructor um, in Stanford, lead course called Customer Experience Design from a Neuroscience Perspective. Today I want to talk to you about something called design thinking. Show of hands, how many people have heard of design thinking? Pretty much everybody, which is awesome. Great. SAP has a very rich history with design thinking. So our founder, Hasso Platner, invested 35 million of his personal funds to found the Stanford D School that is also called the Hasso Platner Institute of Design. Since then, SAP has invested a lot of money to get awareness inside the organization and also to use it to connect to, connect to, um, I'm not sure what's going on there, uh, uh, connect to their customers. Yeah, I saw some smoke coming up. I, I hope everything is okay. <laughs> okay. Ah. Oops, hold on. So I'm happy to note that SAP was included. Something is not right. Okay. I'm happy to note that SAP was included in um, the, the list of design-centric companies by um, uh, Design Management Institute. So Design Management Institute evaluated company based on a set of criteria and identified if they were design-centric. And the good news for all of us in the design community is that they found that customers, uh, companies that were design-centric outperform their peers in the S&P by 211%. So here's some business justification for organizations to invest in design. There are many different visualizations of design thinking. At SAP, we use something called discover, design, and deliver. All through our education and through our um, at work, we are all trained for towards problem solving. So we pride ourselves on how quickly we, we solve problems. But what if the problem that we are solving is the wrong one to begin with? So design thinking avoids this issue by putting problem finding or problem framing before problem solving. So first we diverge and we understand the problem space. Then we converge and we synthesize our understanding and find out exactly which problem we want to solve. Then we diverge again and brainstorm different solutions to the problem we've identified, and then we converge by rapidly testing, prototyping, and iterating until we come up with the right design. There are three key elements to design thinking. Empathy, cross-functional collaboration, and iteration. Empathy 
it refers to truly understanding the needs and the aspirations and the wishes of the person you're designing for. Colla Cross-functional collaboration means going across silos, working with people from different uh, parts of the organization, different skill sets in an open and a collaborative way. Rapid iteration means making small experiments to see what's working, what's not working, overcoming your fear of failure until you come up with good ideas. Here's a glimpse of how we work. We infuse our design projects uh, with interaction designers, visual designers, prototypers. We, we start with empathy and we observe how, how our customers work and the, and the context in which we, uh, they work. We form teams of, uh, of business experts and technologies experts. We come together in an open, inspiring space. We put our ideas from our head. We make it as tangible as possible to avoid miscommunication and to create a common vision. We start with low fidelity of, you know, hand sketches and wireframes, which we iterate and we iterate and we iterate until we come to the final design. This way of working has won us several awards. We have worked this way in many different uh, industries, in marketing, consumer products, aerospace, sports, and public sector. We have worked in, in many industries, over 600 projects in the last four years, all over the world. But today, I want to talk to you about a few sp selected projects from Latin America to illustrate how thoughtful use of technology and design can have transformative effect on um, designing for flood prevention, higher education, and home ownership. First, designing for flood prevention. There is a significant problem that the city of Buenos Aires faced, and that was flooding. So this flooding was caused by uh, torrential rains that, that caused a lot of damage as well as loss of life. To avoid this problem, the, uh, the city approached SAP. They asked the question, how can technology help predict and prevent flooding? So the SAP team interviewed the city officials citizens, as well as waste collectors, to truly understand why the problem happened. Then they installed sensors in drainage uh, sewers where to identify the height, the, the height of the water and the direction of the water. They created a system that combined the information from the interviews, as well as the sensor data as well, and the weather data, to allow people real-time information on uh, as flooding occurs. So when there was flooding, there, there could be an alarm. Since the installation of this system, the, um, the, the officials have real-time visibility into what's going on. And real-time is critical because a delay of minutes can, can cost lives. So they um, cleaned the, the sewer pipes as well as redirected the water to collection ponds. Since the installation of the system, the city is flood free. So let me um, share with you a video that gives you a glimpse of this project. The last big flood that the city of Buenos Aires suffered was in 2013. In some areas of the city, we had close to half a meter of water. The situation was truly terrible. We had casualties due to the flood, and that made us rethink the entire strategy used to face these events. The city is built on nine streams with 1,500 kilometers of rainwater drainage network. And this has to be kept clean so that the water drains away properly. 
muchas operaciones que hoy SAP HANA will allow us to replace many manual tasks with remote and automated systems so that the waterworks can operate at maximum capacity. Esto está relacionado con el mantenimiento de equipos, por ejemplo, de las bombas de impulso. This is related to equipment maintenance, like water pumps or cleaning schedules for the various ducts running through the city. El agua es absolutamente necesaria para la vida. Water is absolutely essential for life, but in excess, it can be destructive. And for that reason, it's the actions of man and engineering that put the power of water in its place. La mejor forma de cuidar a nuestros ciudadanos. The best way to take care of our citizens is by predicting potential issues and developing solutions before the issues occur. La ciudad instalada. The city has installed a number of sensors that allow us to predict flooding to a certain degree. SAP, a través del CRM y a través de HANA, nos permite informar. With SAP CRM and HANA, we can notify residents with weather alerts. El desafío más importante que tiene el gobierno de la ciudad es adaptar. The biggest challenge the city government has is ensuring that the city can adapt to new situations related to both climate changes and changes in habits. Creo que Hanna... I think that Hanna goes beyond being a technology product and represents a cultural shift for those of us who manage services crucial to the operation of the city. SAP helps the city of Buenos Aires run simple. Next, let's talk about designing for higher education. Tech de Monterey is a highly reputed university and a, and a research center. In spite of their elite sa status, they were not happy with the customer experience they provided to three main constituents, students, faculty, and patients. So they approached SAP Design Services to help. The tech team came to Palo Alto and they experienced design thinking firsthand. They were inspired and they had so many ideas for co-innovation. Then the SAP designers went to, um, uh, went to Mexico and they interviewed students. They also talked to faculty. They synthesized their ideas and they found certain focus areas for, um, for innovation. At, when the project was completed, it impacted 150,000 um, students, 14,000 faculty, 100,000 patients, and uh, 250,000 alumni. Now, here is a video that gives you a glimpse of this project. The Design and Co-Innovation Center's engagement with Tech de Monterey began in February 2016 with a small team from Tech visiting our Palo Alto office for a design thinking workshop. Over the course of the next few months, we worked on determining the right engagement to employ a design thinking approach to reimagining some of Tech de Monterey's digital systems and services. A workshop in June brought the voices of students and employees into the project. With a focus on Mi Tech and Mi Espacio, the team conducted in-depth research interviews in Mexico City, Toluca, and Saltillo, representing a total of five campuses. My name is Laura, I'm 16 years old and I'm uh, here in Tech de Monterrey. I work at Tech de Monterrey currently as program director since 2014. Mi espacio is a tool that I use to gather information. Everything together available and you have access to information from all of the campuses. Interviews were documented through video, photos and notes. Back from the field, the team analyzed all data to find interesting stories, patterns and user needs ultimately pointing towards opportunities for improvement. A co-innovation workshop between the DCC, SAP Mexico, and Tech de Monterrey helped craft two unique storyboards and scenarios for an improved experience. Yeah, next I want to talk to you about designing for home ownership. And here are two projects. Cementos Progresos and Confama. So first, Cementos Progresos. 14% of Guatemalans now live in the US to find a better home and to send money back home um, and, and build a home back, uh, back in Guatemala. 
In fact, in 2016, uh, $7 billion were sent from the U.S. to Guatemala, and this constitutes 11% of Guatemala's GDP. Why is this important? 20% of remittances are used to for construction and um, home improvement. And Cementos Pregrosos, uh, um, also known as Sempro, a customer of SAP, wanted to work with us to see how can they improve the experience for this target immigrant de uh, demographic. So we did ethnographic research and guerrilla research um, on, in the fields of San Francisco and, um, and Los Angeles. We brought uh, the CIO of Sempros, who was so excited by this uh, methodology that he also participated in some of the interviews. We synthesized, synthesized the information that we received by um, uh, the aspiring homeowners, and we came up with a holistic system. The final system that was created allowed the uh, the customers to invest as well as get a financial identity because some of the immigrants were struggling with getting a financial identity because uh, to, in order to get a loan. And the other problem was that since they were building the home back in Guatemala and they were still in the U.S., they needed some visibility into the progress of the home. So truly understanding the immigrant po population's needs, we were able to create um, an end-to-end -end and holistic solution for them. The second, um, uh, the second example is Confama. So this is to help simplify the subsidy process for uh, the citizens of Medellin, Colombia. So here the, uh, the, the team interviewed the subsidies, the, the people who were eligible for subsidies to understand how it was to apply for the subsidies. They also talked to the, uh, the people who were responsible for managing the subsidies. We, we attended these information sessions to, and, and conducted exit interviews to see if people could, you know, what were the information needs. We synthesized all this information to truly uh, create a journey map of the, the aspirations, the, the successes, the frustrations of the aspiring homeowner all throughout their, uh, uh, their journey to home ownership. The, we created a hub. Um, a final solution was we created an information hub where the aspiring homeowners could manage every aspect of their, um, of their journey towards uh, finding a home. Now, I want to switch gears and talk to you about Designer 2.0. If innovation is at the confluence of business, technology, and human values, we, we are, in each of these projects, our designers are working alongside the technology experts and business experts, and having, we finally have a seat at the table, and we are able to contribute to, to uh, give, to influence the strategic dire direction of these projects. Now, we finally have a seat at the table, but it comes with certain responsibilities. So what do we need to do to be successful in this new role? So let me leave you with four tips of success for, uh, to be successful as, a, as a, this next generation of designer. First tip, learn new skills. It is very important to hone our skills in user research, interaction design, and visual design, but it is not sufficient. So stretch and grow new skills in technologies and, and, and business to augment your skills and, um, and be able to participate fully at the seat at the table. So, and one way to think about it as it is a, is a T-shaped designer. So the, uh, the vertical line constitutes your design skills, such as uh, user research, interaction design, visual design, but then stretch and grow more you know, horizontally to learn a little bit more about business and learn a little bit about technology so that you can contribute and be confident when you are driving the strategy of these important projects. The second tip, think beyond the screen. With the uh, introduction of IoT, machine learning, AI, 
many of the projects that we work on are beyond the screen. In fact, what's manifested on the screen is only the tip of the iceberg of a lot of thinking and hard work that goes into um, the creation of the screen. So as designers, we need to we, we need to value it, we need to visualize it and represent it, learn from it so that we can start to get better um, over time. One way to do this is to master the art of storytelling. Creating storyboards that tell the story of the customer beyond the screen is one way um, uh, to do this. To help uh, people who are not so skilled in drawing, we've created a toolkit called Scenes. You can go to, um, you can Google SAP Scenes or this URL, and you can download this toolkit and you can use it uh, to quickly create storyboards uh, in your projects. The third tip is to be a catalyst for culture change. Many of the um, organizations are designed for streamlined execution, and they are not ready for a culture of um, innovation and creativity and design. And I think this presents a tremendous opportunity for our community to show leadership and be a catalyst of a culture change. To help uh, change agents like yourself be effective and communicate the business value of creating this new culture, we've created something called fosterinnovationculture.com. It's a 15-minute website that you can access and which will tell you, which will give you a report like this that tells you which stage of an innovation culture your organization is in and what are the key barriers and how to get to the next stage. So uh, this assessment, I'm, I'm very happy to announce, has been, the survey has been translated to Portuguese as well. It's available in English, um, uh, German, French, two dialects of uh, Chinese, Japanese, and as well as Portuguese um, and Spanish. So uh, please go check it out, and you can use this as evidence when you are making the case to your uh, senior executives for for budget and resources and really making the case for innovation. And finally, practice clear communication. When you are if when you want to be a when you want to be a change agent, get used to communicating your message multiple times in multiple ways. To demonstrate this, I would like to do another exercise with you. If you don't mind, find a partner. You can be sitting, but find a partner. Everybody find a partner, yes? So decide who is partner A and who is partner B. Decide, A or B. And I'll give separate instructions to partner A and partner B. Okay, partner A, listen to me, partner A. Partner A, you need to think of your favorite song. Do not, do not say it. Do not just think about your uh, of your fa a favorite song. Don't hum it. Don't sing it. Don't give any clues. And you need to clap your song to partner B. And partner B, you need to guess the song that partner um, A is clapping. So go. Okay, did anybody guess? Anybody guess? Anybody? In this large group, I thought me. Nobody guessed? Oh, one guess. Yes, which song is it? Which song is it? Can I guess? We are the champions? Oh, that's a good one. We are the champions. Okay, that's a good one. Anyone else? <laughs> yes, one more. Which ones? Sorry? Star Wars? Oh, that's a tricky one. How did you guess that? Oh my God, I'm impressed. I, did you hum? I have to ask you. Did you hum it? Did you hum or sing it or something? No. 
Star Wars, you, you, you figured out Star Wars? Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so, now I have a question for partner A. When you were clapping the song, did you have the song playing in your head? Was the song playing in your head? Yes? Yes? Thumbs up if yes. Okay. Now, question for partner B. When partner A was clapping the song, did you hear the song in partner A's head? No. No, right? So this is the problem. When we are so passionate about something and we are trying to communicate it to somebody else, we hear the song in our heads. And everyone else just hears the clapping. So remember that when you are trying to make the case and be a catalyst for change, remember that they have a different perspective and they may just be hearing the clapping. So don't get frustrated. Don't get impatient. Just practice and, and repeat your message in multiple ways, multiple times. And with that, I wish you much luck to be a change agent with people so passionate, so amazing, such as yourself, you will be a force for change, a force to be reckoned with, and I hopefully a force for good. Are you ready to be a designer 2.0? Obrigada. Olá, parabéns pela palestra. Há pouco tempo eu estava estudando um pouco sobre gestão da inovação e inovação disruptiva. É um assunto que sempre vem à mente, assim, é, é parte dos estudos desses, desses grandes autores. E aí, tanto o Christensen quanto o Chess Brugge, eles reclamaram um pouco disso. Porque, inevitavelmente, as pessoas não têm muito tempo de se aprofundar em um determinado assunto. E... Acontece que elas começam a falar repetidamente sobre essas buzzwords. Então, esses dois autores reclamaram hum. disso, se posicionaram hum. a partir disso. E aí eu queria saber qual que é a sua visão sobre inovação disruptiva hum. e que você pudesse compartilhar com, com o resto das pessoas aqui, para que elas ganhassem mais profundidade. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. The question was, you know, um, about disruptive innovation and is a technology buzzword just, just not, you know, too much buzz, right? So here's my view, right? I think disruptive innovation is definitely something that people should pay attention to. And as we've seen in, by the other speakers, uh, technology is advancing at an exponential pace. So you would be foolish not to, not to um, pay attention to this, you know, for the sustainability and the long-term longevity of your business. However, the mistake that I see people doing is they're focusing on just the technology. They're just, you know, looking at where can I put IoT? Where can I put, you know, where can I use machine learning? Where can I use artificial intelligence? They're looking at it very much as a, uh, from a technology perspective. And it almost is like a, a hammer looking for a nail, you know? What I propose is that while technology is the enabler to disruption, but it is not the catalyst. The catalyst really is the end-to-end -end poor customer experience. So when a, it is usually in those pockets where people are really frustrated with your, your customers are really frustrated, that is the entry point that a, a competitor can come in and they can do it really faster and they can scale really fast because they're using newer technologies. And you probably are a well-established business and you have certain processes and procedures, and so you're not able to adapt as quickly. So instead, if you proactively look at your customer experience and you identify where are your weak points and you proactively have a culture within the company that is always asking, how can we do this better? How can we do this better? Then you have, you build in some resilience to disruption. That is my thesis. Uh, eu gostaria de saber quais são os desafios para escalar design eh, numa empresa global, no nível global, eh, e como fazer isso tornar central dentro da empresa, né? Que vocês falaram que a, a, a SAP ela se tornou design centric. Uh -huh. 
queria saber como é o desafio e se existe alguma maneira clara de fazer isso. Yeah, thank you for the question. So SAP is design centric now. In 2016, we, we were categorized as design centric based on the DMI criteria. But remember, it took us 12 years from the time SAP's founder invested in uh, design thinking to us slowly changing the minds of uh, internally with, within the company as well as externally with the customers. So it is not an overnight thing. It takes a lot of hard work. Now, let me, you, you mentioned, I'm assuming you're asking how can you make that change within your organization. Am I right? Yes? Okay. So there are four stages of an innovation culture. The first stage is interested. Interested means organizations will say, yes, I am very interested in innovation and design, but they are not willing to invest. So the senior executives will not give you time to do research or get your designers. The second stage is invested. Usually there are some innovation pockets. So there are incubation teams or small teams that are doing some innovation, but it is not widespread within the organization. That's stage two. In stage three, now the organization is adapting, um, uh, sees design as a competence, and every time a project begins, they want to use design, think, design and design thinking, but there's not enough. Like, there aren't enough designers. We have a lot here, but honestly, if you, every single project had design or design thinking, we don't have enough. So you, you've chosen a very good profession, by the way. And finally, scaled. We're using design and design thinking as a way to drive strategy. It is no longer just to create products, but it is used to, uh, you know, if you are a footwear, footwear um, manufacturer, how can I go into fitness? If I'm a cereal manufacturer, how can I go into uh, nutrition? So really rethinking and reimagining um, the whole business strategy. So the, the, those are the four uh, stages. Um, but, you know, you need to know where you are and where you need to go. And I think that's where the, the survey that I pointed you to can help you do that self-evaluation. I hope that helps. And talk to me later if you want more questions. Hi, Janaki. Thanks for the presentation. Oh, sure. And my question is because I'm also a service designer. Ah, and I know that the challenge is also for selling the project for, for the companies. Yes. I would like to know um, what is the percentage of the projects that you can um, implement like physically and how do you do that thank you so the the teams the projects that i'm i'm mentioning yes yes so if i'm a little bit implement. of a fortunate position here because i i i we are a strategic design team we are part of the product and innovation group the the projects come to us um that are already important you know what i mean so they we pay for our they uh, they pay for our services we are kind of a design agency within sap they pay for our services and we work with um, uh, technologists and business experts so by the nature of this the strategic nature of the projects i already get certain things taken care of uh -huh. but i fully realize that this is not the case for all projects right and, and with that so our stakeholders came to us and said, you know, the way you're working, the, the video that I showed you, it makes a lot of sense. Why, why aren't all my projects working like this? Why can't we? So um, to help them articulate and make the case is where uh, we came up with this fosterinnovationculture.com so that you can, see, you can tell them this is the best practice back, uh, more objectively back to the senior executives. Yeah, yeah. But in the case, I would like to know if you implement all of the projects or it's just like uh, future oh, scenarios that yes, you Yes, yes. So um, the, it, it is mixed. So sometimes okay. the, it, it all depends on what the customer wants. Sometimes the customer just wants to reimagine their business. So, you know, in that case, we do design thinking workshops, ideation, um, and that's what they want. We, our deliverable may be a storyboard, for example, and that they take back to their board of directors to say, you know, we need to go in this direction, and they get funding for the, uh, the next wave. So that, that could be that project, right? Another project could be, you know, I'm a, a sports franchise, and I want to re, uh, relaunch my website. I want you guys all the way for six months till the, the project is launched. They pay for it. We are there till the end. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Janaki Palma. Thank you.